Hello. Hi, how's it going? Hey, is this Josh? Yes. Hey, good to talk to you, man. John. Oh, good to talk to you, too. Uh, thank you for making the time to uh, be able to do this interview to promote the brand new Hammers of Misfortune album, uh, Dead Revolution, which comes out next week through Metal Blade. I've gotten the chance to listen to it a few times, and I really love the direction you guys are going in so far. Oh, thanks. Uh, so I, I noticed. Oh, you like it? Um, I, I noticed right off the bat it was a lot darker than a lot of stuff that you've done in the past with Hammers of Misfortune. Was that something that was like uh, predetermined, or did that just happen in the studio? Uh, I think it was both. Uh, it was predetermined to the point where I just, you know, I generally write darker material. You know, not super necro or brutal or anything, but uh, I think it, a lot of it is the production. Uh, we went into a more primitive recording situation, and uh, things were just kind of dirtier, and there wasn't, the computer wasn't a huge part of our process. Um, it was just more of a raw situation, you know what I mean? Um, and I think that contributed to the darkness. And, you know, I guess maybe that was uh, what I set out to do as well. I wanted to make like a metal record, you know? Uh, which is what I always want to do, but this one just came out sounding closer to heavier, you know what I mean? Oh yeah, uh, I mean, compared to the last record, I mean, this feels a lot darker, and it goes into that great progressive and folky moments as well. I mean, it's a very diverse and well-rounded album. Yeah, the thing is that, like, it's hard for me to explain, but I think I always want to do that, and we always kind of do that in a way, but, like, the last album, 17th Street, actually has more fast songs on it than this one, but people are saying that this is a faster album and i i don't understand why that might be but it's it's interesting the way people react i mean the productions on the last couple of hammers album i thought were really clear and and clean and kind of sparkly or something <laughs> um but i wanted something dang dirty you know and, and I uh I, you know, part of that is we were recorded on this really old, <clears throat> this really old board, like a trident, massive thing from the early 70s or maybe even the late 50s. And um, that didn't make our sound dirtier, but it was definitely more, the whole thing was just more organic. I'm sorry, I'm probably not doing a very good job of answering these questions. Oh, not <laughs> at all. I mean, I'd rather it's have this sound more like... you know, when you go into this, huh? Oh, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Oh, it's okay. Oh, I was just saying I'd rather have this sound more like a conversation than uh, feeling like it's scripted between you and me so anything you want to say feel free yeah i mean i have a tendency to ramble and lose my train of thought so uh <laughs> you know don't be afraid to uh, knock me back onto the track um uh but what i was gonna say is when you go into the studio you just never know on our budget which is always way too tight there's never enough time there's never enough money uh, we went into the studio because it's in the same building as our rehearsal space and the guys who run the recording studio also run the rehearsal space so i went in there and checked it out and I saw this huge old trident board and a massive recording tracking room like the size of a gymnasium in there and I was like holy shit this is a great place to record and it's right down the hall from our practice room so we don't have to rent a van and load in load out I mean Sigrid at the time was eight months pregnant you know and it was just they were offering us a good deal because it's in the same building we we're on a tight budget and you know we had to work fast and it came out the way it came out uh, largely through the just the will of the recording guy God, you know, um, I'm not, we, we are not endowed with uh, the kind of budget that allows us to really control everything that happens in the snow. We have to do things on a tight budget. So, yeah. I, you know, I would love to say we could go to Kurt Ballow and make it perfect, you know, but, or <laughs> Billy Anderson or, or um, Randall Dunn or Stanford Parker or any of these really, really great engineers, but we simply just don't have the budget. It's really kind of a drag. It, it, so it, what it, it came out the way it came out, man. I mean, we tried, to, we did our best with what we had, you know, but. Well, I'm the studio, I think, had a great deal of influence, and I think it was also set out to do that, and then the rest of it was just an accident of eight. Well, honestly, I think it worked out for the best that way, because it does have a very aggressive vibe to it, being more raw in the production, and I think that's kind of why people are saying that this is a, a faster album, is because it does have that rawness and intensity to it that, that uh, the clear and pristine production doesn't always give. Yeah, I would agree with that, absolutely. Uh, the productions we had before were great, but I, yeah, yeah, definitely, I agree. I mean, temp tempo-wise, the last album is faster, no question. Yeah. There are three, like, straight-up DB songs on the last album, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, but this one only has one real quick number. The rest of it's, you know, pretty mid-tempo, but people perceive it for some reason. I don't know, it's always interesting to see how people react, you know? Oh, yeah. And again, I think it is just because of the production being more raw. So when they hear more raw, they think of it as 
faster and more aggressive that way, even if the tempo is slower in comparison to more clean, pristine production. It's just like a trick of the ear that way. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, I always wanted hammers to be heavy and raw, always. Um, and the failure is mine, you know? I just couldn't get it done. You know, I just, uh, you know, I, I guess I don't need to bring up the budget things anymore but you know i always want it really heavy and raw and we just haven't been able to just haven't been able to get it you know um so i think we got it we got closer anyway on this album to where we've kind of always wanted to be you know the other album we did uh, the august engine i thought came out nice and heavy oh yes you yeah. know um real nice guitar tone you know uh that, that album definitely has a great deal of flaws in the production too but um you know uh since the august engine the, the albums just haven't had that kind of heaviness i've always always wanted it but i haven't been able to get it and it's my fault you know i'm learning learning as i go along <laughs> <laughs> what would you say uh, from a production standpoint is the biggest thing you've learned over the years i mean saying that you've uh, learned from your mistakes what would you say is the biggest thing that you've learned in production oh geez dude like a lot man a lot a lot a lot i mean i don't even know where to start um i could write a book <laughs> you know of all the mistakes i've made you know i mean the biggest thing is just before you go into the studio all the stuff that you should really do before you even go in you know and i learned this the hard way with Ludacra and you know making and producing all those records too you know we'd go in without even having the vocals sorted out yet and then trying to sort out all the vocals in the studio paying studio hourly rate it's murder you know it's really really a bad idea so i mean the first thing we really try to do on this one is pre-produce all the vocals so we know exactly what we're going to be singing where before we set foot in the studio um i tried to uh have you know as much practice as possible just so we could play the songs with our eyes closed you know that's super important also i have to say reamping the guitars has been a really 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 time-saving great thing for me uh, it doesn't save me any time at all but it saves us on studio time and studio cost because i can sit up until four in the morning in my room dreaming up guitar parts and you know trying different beads and stuff without having to pay you know sitting there with an engineer and paying hourly rate studio i mean that's murder that's it's just so much stress, you know. So, those are some of the things. Also, our new rhythm section, Will and Paul, are really quick studies. Uh, Paul is a classically trained musician, so he reads music. So, that's awesome. I can hand him the sheet music and he can go, you know. And if he wants to add or subtract, that's up to him. But, you know, I don't have to sit there and show him the bass line. I can just hand it to him. That saves a shitload of time. And Will also learns stuff extremely quickly. And he tracks those drums really fast, man. He was done, you know, we we're in on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday for drums. He was done on Friday. <laughs> Oh, nice. You know? <laughs> yeah, that was super cool. Well, I do love hearing that. I mean, it sounds like uh, even though the studio is right down the hall, that all of you guys had your stuff together to be able to record quick and proper. That way, you don't have to feel that murder of uh, paying the hourly rates at the studio and keep it at a minimum. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, you still spend a lot of time uh, trying to get performances. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Um, the singers and guitar players, everybody, you know, they're super sensitive about their performance and they should be, you know, uh, but when you're just trying to design or learn the fucking part in the studio, man, you got to do that. And then you have to work on getting your performance, which takes three times as long and it's extremely stressful. And then since you had to come up with the vocal parts on the spot, this is more for Ludacre than for Hammers, but, um, you, you know, a year later, you're like, I wish I had done something else because I just had, I was on the spot, you know? Oh, yeah. I mean, when so. it when it when it comes to performance and, of course, like mic placement in the studio, whether it's drums or amps or getting the right uh, technique vocally, I mean, I imagine that also eats up into the studio time just as much as the performance. Oh, yeah. I mean, Nick was really quick. Uh, Nick Dimitriou, the, the engineer, he was real quick with the mic placement, dialed that shit in real quick. But the other nice thing about reamping is that things like guitar tones and bass tones take a long time. You know? So we spend more time working on the guitar tones on this album than we ever have because I wasn't worried about getting the performance in the studio because I did that at home. So all we really had to do was dial in our guitar tone and then reamp the guitar tracks through the amps but uh, that in itself took a long time and i had so many amps and guitar tracks <laughs> recorded you know it takes a long time to sift through all that recorded material so i've definitely learned from this experience that i need to keep things much better organized and simpler in my tracking so you know i had three rhythm guitars going an sg a les paul and a telecaster and they were all going through two or three different amps each oh wow so that's 
eight or nine rhythm guitar tracks at a time and we're only using one or two of them you know and then we'll have Layla playing the other guitar and she was going through a couple of three amps too so uh, that took a long time and uh, I probably won't do that quite the same way again uh, I'm really fond of the idea of having different guitar tones coming in and out on the record I mean if you listen to the song the guitar tones are different not one like most metal albums there's one guitar tone you know, the guitar tone on this album you know uh, but this album and the vol record that we made um, kind of concurrently with it, uh, Deeper Than Sky. The guitar tone change with every song and then in the song, so different. Oh, you know? yeah. The guitar tone on Days of 49 is totally different guitar tone on Be of Hero. You know? And when it comes... In my ears, anyway. Oh, yeah. When it comes to the guitar tone, I mean, did you know beforehand the kind of sound that you were looking for and it took a while to get that in the studio or did you record it and you weren't happy with the tone you were getting and then it took a while to dial in uh, i would i had the guitars all recorded at home so i don't know if you you are familiar with the technique of reamping. yeah but um so i had the performances and then i definitely knew what kind of tones i wanted um but I've never been a real great tone chaser um, because uh, that takes money. Uh, you ha If you're going to experiment with different amps and different speakers and different kinds of tubes, you have to be able to buy all that stuff or be sponsored or something. And I've never had that luxury. So. <laughs> I'm kind of limited to what we have at hand, and um, I did my best to get specific tones, like there's there's guitar tones on certain records that I just love, you know, and I'm trying to get something along those lines, and I got pretty close in spots, like there's a couple of like lead tones, like at the end of the precipice, there's a guitar solo that comes in, I'm like, holy fuck, I got like the, the Victor Griffin pentagram sound on that lead, so good, man, I've been trying to get that for years, you know. <laughs> Yeah, and it worked, you know? Yeah, I was uh, actually going to bring that up, too. I mean, I love the tone of that solo. I mean, it just fits so perfect right there. It, it really, we really hit the bullseye on that one, man. That's like one of my favorite guitar tones I've ever gotten. Nice. Um, at the very end there, and uh, I did it by using a stationary wah position uh, with an old Morley wah pedal and then rolling the tone knob back on the car about halfway, and then we, the rest of it was just pure fucking luck. I think it was going through a Marshall Governor like an old governor pedal. I don't know, man. I can't remember. Uh, when I listened to it later, after, you know, we had the baby, I listened to it later, I'm like, oh my God, how did I get that tone? <laughs> <laughs> Fuck, I forgot. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I remember some of the details, but, you know, it's one of those things, you know. Next time, next time, we'll try to do it, you know, be more careful and, and just take better notes and fuck, man. You know, I should have just taken pictures of everything I did, and, you know. Well, I can see but, that happening, though, when you're in the studio and you, you just get that tone that you're looking for. You don't always remember to save everything beforehand. You're just so happy with it. You want to be able to get it out there and get it recorded and make it sound the best you can. I can see that happening. Yeah, and you're... You're, you're under time pressure as well. Yeah. I mean, that's the main problem. You're under time pressure. You're getting this done. Sounds great. Okay, awesome. Let's get on to the next part. You know? Yeah. So, so that's a big that's a big problem. I mean, gone are the days when you can have tea and go out for walks and go out to lunch, then come back and do another take of the song and bring in an orchestra or some string players. Those days are gone, man. It's really a shame. Uh, you know, and we went over budget. Yeah. You know, I mean, even with as primitive as it was, went over budget. So that was a problem no, unfortunately that does happen i mean there's always circumstances in the studio where you uh, you never get to plan for like being in the studio longer or something failing or uh, something happening with instruments you know it's like there's always things that happen like that but at least i can say as a fan of you guys and loving the new album i think it was definitely worth the hassle that it went through to get this album out to her oh yeah oh yeah i appreciate that man and it's you know i'm not complaining don't get me wrong i mean i love recording uh with all the stress and everything else i absolutely adore being in duo that's my favorite thing to do man like some folks love to be on stage and they love to be performing in front of people and you know, that ain't me, man. I like being behind the scenes in the studio. That's the creative process, man. That's what I really like. I mean, I'm nervous on stage. I feel, you know, like I'm not, <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. I, I don't feel that comfortable in front of crowds. I'm a very shy person, uh, you know, so I'm not, don't get me wrong. I'm not complaining about being in the studio. I mean, yeah. It was wonderful. All the stress, the challenges, you're absolutely right. That it's always something, something always breaks or goes wrong or, you know, somebody can't make it down on their day to record and schedule half and the whole freaking thing is it's a stress fest and all that but i fucking love it and i'll probably do it forever yeah and that's the great thing about being in the studio because 
you only need to have pressure on yourself and the band. And like in a live setting, you have to have pressure on yourself, the band, and the crowd that paid to watch you as well. So there's all that added pressure on there to be able to play the best it, that you can. When you're in the studio, you don't have yeah. to worry about the crowd at the time. You have to worry about it later, whether they like it or not. But while you're recording, you just need to make sure that you're playing the best that you can and uh, get it in the best tracks possible. Yeah, you know, in, in my experience, I think a lot of musicians really feed off the crowd and really prefer to be in front of an audience. Uh, most of them uh, would rather play live a hundred times before going in the studio. I mean, a lot of musicians I've played with don't really like going in the studio because there's no one there to, to interact with or to, you know what I mean? The exchange of energy that happens at a live show is really what they feed off of, what they like, you know? So there's really not that, you know, in short, it's really... There's not a whole lot of glory for your performer type in the studio. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> There's no one there to go, oh man, that was awesome. You know, <laughs> at the end. Like, you have to wait and wait and wait. It takes forever to get the record out, and you feel like you just worked your ass off. And, you know, nobody applauded except the engineer. <laughs> me you know so i understand why people don't like it but i fucking love it man that's where the real, real well, that's where the, the, the magic happens for me yeah and you can be so proud of yourself with that studio take because you know later down the road people are going to be able to check that out for the first time and see what you've been proud of and getting that release out there well you know an album is forever a uh, live show is over when it's over unless somebody filmed it on their fucking phone oh yes and it's horrible you quality know? and then half yeah, and then half the time you wish they hadn't, you know. Oh, yeah. Um, but, you know, people don't have sex to the live show very often, <laughs> although I have seen it. I have um, as well. <laughs> but, they, you know, people don't drive to work, you know, uh, at a live show. They drive to work listening to your album. Yeah. You know, they, they don't, you know, the, the album is the thing they put on late at night when they're, you know, trying to get through a breakup or something, you know. The album is the thing that, you know, kids discover 10 years later, you know. So albums are, me, that's where it's at, man, you know. That's, that's for posterity. Those albums will be around long after we're dead, long after we're, we are not able to tour anymore or whatever, you know. And hopefully... Um, you look at a band like Dark Throne, you know, they've never played. Yeah. Not since they, they went over to black metal anyway. When I mean, they were a death metal band, they played a couple shows, but they never played ever. Or Leviathan, or, you know, the list goes on and on. They just made great albums. Huge and influential albums, so... Yeah. And, and speaking of that, when you do play that darker, evil stuff, how do you think that compares uh, in your playing as compared to... Hammers of Misfortune. Well, the first thing that's different is I don't write the lyrics for any of that shit. Uh, <clears throat> I write lyrics for Hammers, mm -hmm. uh, and that makes it different for me. Um, because with Vol or Ludacra, I'm basically, I mean, I'm writing riffs, I'm scratching an itch. I mean, I have this, like, physical need to play really fast, you know? <laughs> and I love that kind of music. I mean, I sit around listening to thrash, you know, or black metal much more than I do progressive. Um, and that's not to say I don't love progressive. Progressive. I do love progressive, and I listen to it a lot. But mostly, my first love is thrash, you know. Um, and I love playing that kind of music, and I love writing those kind of riffs. But I'm not going to write the lyrics. <laughs> <laughs> That's up to somebody else, man. I just want to write the music and, and record it, you know, and produce the album. Like, I, I have all kinds of ideas for vocal harmonies and all that kind of stuff, but lyrics are hard, man. Lyrics are really hard to write for me. I had to teach myself how to write lyrics, to write lyrics for Hammers, um, and it, it still comes really hard. Um, so, but yeah, Hammers is a different beat, you know. I wanted to make Hammers into a songwriting thing. Like, I want to write, like, you know, like the Beatles or Simon and Garfunkel or Bob Dylan were songwriters, you know. Mm -hmm. um, they wrote great songs and like I've always been an admirer of that craft and I've always tried to like take that craft and try to apply it to metal somehow because metal doesn't really lend itself to that kind of songwriting because it's so concentrated on riffs you know but but you can try you know <laughs> or you know the Beach Boys with all those great vocal harmonies and counterpoint stuff you know I wanted to like I love all that you know um, <clears throat> Roxy Music Pink Floyd I love it Bowie you know I listen to all that all kinds of stuff like that and I wanted to have all those tools in my toolbox for hammer a uh, queen you know uh so uh it that answer your question? I mean, it's just a totally different approach, you know? And at the same time, I want hammers to be dark and heavy, too, because that's just my taste. So, but the songwriting thing, totally different. For a, a band like Vol, I want to write something that's just from the gut, visceral, crazy, you know, psychedelic, crazy, manic thrash, because it's, it's awesome. I love it, you know? Hammers is more like uh, art, like artsy. I'm going to, I'm starting to ramble now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's quite all right. I mean, I love hearing that insight about it, too. I mean, 
you know, with Hammers and Vol and Ludacra being very different from each other. I mean, it's it's very cool to be able to hear that from the outside about the different perspectives that go into the songwriting like you've done. Well, yeah, there's also an attitude different, too, because Ludacra, um, Ludacra was all about just, it was a really dark trip. It was really a lot about depression, you know? Um, and I would try to write, you know, sad riffs for Ludacra. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and, you know, a more emotionally dark, really not even so much evil, just, just twisted and depressed and just feeling like shit, you know, like addiction and suicide and all that shit, you know? And I'm so fucking tired of that bullshit, man. (laughs) Sorry. That's Carter. So tired. I was depressed. Oh, I'm so sad. Oh, poor me. You know, I'm like so fucking sick of that shit. What a bunch of crybabies. I mean, I'm not saying that about Ludacra. Because yeah. Ludacra had its own thing. But man, I'm so tired of this defeatist, self-pitying attitude. It's uh, insufferable, man. Did you, um, did you so feel that way at I all? I definitely, when... with Vol, it was definitely get, uh, we don't want, I don't want any, we want this music to make you feel strong not weak yeah. you know um so anyway that was an aside i guess oh yeah when when it came to Ludacra, you uh, of course with the dark and depressing uh, lyrics and emotional riffs behind it were you feeling that way at all during that writing process when the band was still around or was that something that was like out of your spectrum and something you were not dealing with at the time to try to get that emotion. Oh no, we were all dealing with it. We were all dealing with it, man. We were, we were all struggling with addiction and <clears throat> and depression and you know, we were an urban black metal band that formed in the late 90s. I mean, it was uh, there was a lot of uh, you know, we've all been seen our share of friends die from overdose and uh, you know, I don't want to get into all that, but Oh yeah, sure. It was a dark time and we went to a dark place cuz that's we lived in a dark place and and you know, we still do to an extent. Uh but you know, you get older and you try to get yourself out of shitty situations, try to like, you know, stay away from shit that's you know, going to kill you, you know? Um, but there's, you know, there's always going to be heartbreak and bad breakups. You know, the second Ludacar record, all of us were going through painful breakups. All of us, the whole band, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. and we called it another great love song. <laughs> uh, but we definitely worked that out in the music. And I've, I was always very conscious of like uh, that, like emotional darkness and depression when I was writing through the riffs. Absolutely. Um, it was always really, I mean, it's totally different from Vol, man. I mean, yeah. totally different. Mm-hmm. With Vol, I just want to fucking kick ass. I'm, I'm tired of crying. Yeah. It's fighting back, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so that's, you know, with Ludacris, I had my fill of that kind of stuff. And there's a place for that and I'm not, you know what I mean? Yeah. I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with it to an extent. Yeah. But the whole depresso metal thing, I, I'm done with it. I have my fill. I have a I have a child now, you know, and he does all the crying for me. <laughs> <laughs> That's a you great way to it. I can't sit around and dwell on no my own uh, runaway emotion. No, I'm I'm uh, I'm done with that, man. Yeah, I hope I'm getting my point across. Oh, I absolutely. Mean, I mean, I'm going through uh, personal stuff as well with uh, depression. I've been suffering through it for about 16 years, and I noticed that sometimes it takes positive, sometimes it takes negative music for me to get out of that. Uh, Ludicrous sometimes can help with that positive stuff, but I also notice when there's other of that depressive, suicidal black metal that's out there just makes you feel even worse and you want to be happier than that so you just don't want to sit and dwell just like you were talking about when do yeah you... if you look at a band like leviathan man like he goes way way dark yeah and he's a fucking dark dude man like i could <laughs> never be that guy uh, i don't know man uh, you know like a lot of this really dark black metal i love it you now but it's like you're saying I, I could never be you know i mean having been depressed myself i i can't write music when i'm depressed i can't even listen to music when i'm depressed yeah I mean, when I'm depressed, there's just nothing, mm-hmm. you know? There's nothing. It's just, like, complete emptiness. Like, there's no joy in music. There's no joy playing music or writing music or listening to music. It's a complete lack of any will to do anything. And I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. Oh, absolutely. Um, I, I can't, when I hear, oh, I listen to this music when I'm depressed, I'm like, well, if you're listening to music when you're depressed, you have a different depression than I have. Because I w- I'll never, put, if I'm writing or listening to music, I'm generally feeling all right. I can. I mean, I've been through a couple of serious music-related burnouts yeah. too. So every time you come back from a real burnout, uh, you have like a little bit less of a tolerance for music because 
you go for a year where you can't even listen to anything. So, um, I mean, I've been through that too. So you know, maybe I'm different from the average listener. I'm sure I am. Well, I mean, that, that does make a lot of sense, especially when you have a career that's based in music. Sometimes the last thing you want to do is listen to music to get over it since you deal with it 24-7. Well, yeah, I mean, I went through a phase where I was booking a metal club. I was in five bands. I was going to school, uh, and I went on, like, three consecutive fucking tours, and after I finished with all that shit, I never wanted to hear another guitar again. No, <laughs> I was like, I never want to hear another guitar, story guitar, in my life, ever. I was really, like, serious clinically burnt out and uh it took me about a year to one day i just on a whim put on some hendrix and i was like oh yeah i like this stuff i still like this stuff <laughs> <laughs> you know and like my my girlfriend was like oh you're coming back you're coming back you put on hendrix man that's always a good sign you know <laughs> So, so, you know, uh, you know, okay, well, why does it take five years between albums? Well, sometimes, at, at least at, at one point, between um, probably the Locust Years and Fields Church, uh, a burnout had happened, and that took me a long time to recover. Yeah. So, I'm not sure how we got on that subject. Again, I'm rambling. Well, that's all right. But I, I did want to lighten the mood a little bit before we wrap things up here. Uh, talking about with Ludacra, and of course, with all the emotional stuff that goes on, uh, tragically in life. What was that moment that made you want to get out of that and start not writing about the depressive stuff and writing more positive and emotional music in that sense? Uh, I wouldn't say positive. <clears throat> well, more but, positive than Ludacra, anyways. Uh, well, I don't know if there was uh, one particular moment, but I think it might have been... I was listening to a band, and I'm not going to say who it was, but it was doomy and, you know, and sad and so sad and heartbroken and, oh, woe is me. And I'm, it just clicked. I'm like, you know what? Fuck this. Fuck this being defeated. Because you know what I loved about metal to begin with? And just give me a minute to, to explain this. Oh, sure. Like, having grown up, you know, poor, lower middle class, working class, uh, working shitty fucking jobs, being picked around in school, being picked around by my fucking boss, you know, working for 325 an hour uh, from the time I was 14 fucking years old. You know, my mom faked my birth certificate and put me to work because I had to basically help out, you know. Um, when I put on metal, it made me feel not defeated. You know what I mean? It made me feel like I can do this, man. You know, like I'm going to get up and fucking kick ass, you know. And I was listening to Venom and Slayer and a lot of Discharge and stuff like that and Sabbath, you know. And it wasn't like happy music, but it made me feel stronger. Like as a working class kid, you know, it was that music was in my fucking DNA. It was made for me by kids like me. And, you know, it was it wasn't it was the opposite of sitting around feeling sad and defeated. It was getting up and like I'm gonna overcome this shit, you know? That is what I'm like with Vol, I want it to be that kind of metal. The kind of metal that makes you want to get up and fight back. Or go in and tell your boss to fuck off. You know what I mean? <laughs> uh, or whatever. You know what I, Am I explaining myself well here? Or? Oh, absolutely. I totally get that. And that's why I've always been drawn to metal for the exact same reasons of not wanting to sit there and dwell, but just like wanting to go out there and kick ass and make something of yourself. Yeah, and, and rise above your, the shit you grew up in, yeah. you know? Um, and, and overcome problems, not sit there and wallow in problems, you know? Um, so I'm like, yeah, anger and, and menace and all that stuff, you know, the music is big and bombastic because it's for people that feel small and people that feel insignificant. And that's why it's such a huge thing for, like, working class kids is because they do feel small and nobody gives a fuck about them. And, you know, but metal is this big, bombastic, powerful sound that they can relate to and they can make themselves, you know? And I really wanted to get back to that sort of attitude. Um, and I'm happy I did, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm Because I just want to fucking rock, man. I don't want to sit around and feel sorry for myself. You know? Yeah. <laughs> There's and, too much of that going on, you know? And I just got tired of it. Yeah, and I'm glad to see it, too, because through Vol and through Hammers of Misfortune, I definitely hear that kind of change that's going on now. And I think it's a very welcome change that's coming back in the metal. And hopefully it does take over more of not trying to be depressive, but just trying to write good music that makes you want to go out there and experience music just like how I experience uh, the new Hammers of Misfortune album. I definitely feel that way when I listen to it. It just puts me in a good state of mind even more so and just being able to enjoy things while I'm listening to it. Yeah, well, I'm really happy that, that, that that's, that's working that way for you, man. That's great to hear. Um, you know, uh, I know for myself when I put on the 
I put on music, it makes you want to, you know, if I'm working, you know, doing physical labor, um, like at my job or whatever, if I'm, if I'm playing my playlist when I'm working, I work three times harder, man. I get so much more done, you know, because <laughs> it gives me energy, man. And, you know, I, again, I hate to belabor this point, but like, I was just tired of music that's zapping energy. I want music that gives energy, yeah. you know, so there you have it. 